Hello everyone. Welcome to Surviving the API Security Apocalypse webinar presented to you by WSO2. We will deep dive into the importance of API security and its best practices in this webinar. I'm Tarika Madhura and I have my colleague Sampat Rajapaksha will also join me to conduct this webinar. By the end of this webinar, you will understand why we should think about API security seriously. The most common pitfalls of API security that we always ignore, including zombie APIs. The essentials of API security that we must incorporate into our systems today and the best practices for API security with DevOps and CICD pipelines. So simply put, API is an acronym that stands for Application Programming Interface. It is a common point of contact for a specific functionality required by multiple client applications. If you have an API, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. For example, if you have two applications that need to incorporate the online payment functionality, and if this is exposed over an API, you can use the same payment API for both the applications without having to duplicate the implementation. This middleman characteristic of an API has made it possible for developers to reuse, automate, innovate, and build world-class applications collaboratively. Industries today show an increased adoption to APIs because of their digital transformation initiatives and the requirement to empower their stakeholders to access applications, data, and business functions. APIs have become one of the topmost assets that a business would have because APIs help promote business growth, innovation, and data management. Therefore, we have seen an explosive growth in API usage in the past couple of years. In a recent report on API security by Gartner, which is titled Predicts 2022, APIs Demand Improved Security and Management, they state, that in the analysis by Akamai, API requests comprise 83% of all hits, and it keeps growing by 30% year over year, where it is expected to reach 42 trillion by 2024. That is huge. In the same report, it says, it lists two key trends that have caused this exponential growth in API usage. Number one, Organizations are rapidly adopting APIs to deliver services and data, both internally and externally, due to their simplicity and increased access to technology and standards. Number two, new approaches and use cases involving APIs are emerging, especially as the regulations and mandates force API adoption in industries such as banking and healthcare. While APIs make the life easier for developers and help businesses grow, they are at the same time a treasure trove of invaluable data. APIs are really good at exposing all kinds of data, which in turn makes it a number one concern for data security. This is an often quoted prediction by Gartner. They made this prediction in 2017. They said, that by 2022, API abusers will be the most frequent attack vector resulting in data breaches for enterprise web applications. So this has proved to be right already due to the fact that we have started seeing a huge increase of API attacks in the previous two weeks itself. In the latest report by Sort Labs, State of API Security of Q3 2022, a review on their customer data reveals that 2.1% of all API traffic is malicious API traffic. So why should we be so concerned on API security? If your company suffers an API security breach, it will cause a brand or reputation damage. This can hardly be reversed. You will also have to suffer financial loss and even data loss, depending on the nature and severity of the attack. If the new application that you are trying to release is identified to have security concerns, there will be unanticipated delays in rollout. Now, I will take you through two of the top API security breaches and security loophole discoveries that have happened very recently, that is 
in 2021 to identify where things could easily go wrong. John Deere is an agricultural equipment manufacturer. It is well known for producing tractors, harvesters, and other farm equipment. It was discovered that it is possible to call John Deere APIs and determine if a particular username is already taken. They automated calls against this API using an existing list of Fortune 1000 company names and were able to identify which companies were John Deere customers and their associated account names. This leaky API did not have any form of authentication and no rate limiting in place, as it was possible to go through the entire data store in less than two minutes and determine that roughly 20% of the Fortune 1000 companies had John Deere accounts. Such leaky APIs give attackers valuable information that they can use to carry out their attacks and fraud. This can also lead to regulatory penalties. Experian is a consumer credit reporting company. It was discovered that it is possible to retrieve personal information regarding an individual's credit worthiness from an API exposed by them. This API was designed to use minimal identifying and authentication material, most of which is essentially available publicly. There were attributes such as first name, last name, address, zip code, and birthday. The use of easily guessable and brute forceable authentication material like these made this API leaky. It also results in excessive data exposure and in turn can create massive privacy implications. Now, let's talk about the most common pitfalls of API security. We often tend to ignore them. Number one, zombie APIs and shadow APIs. You can't secure what you don't know about. Surprisingly, some companies know that they had an API only when it was breached. This has become one of the most common pitfalls that has led to API security breaches. You have to know your APIs. Zombie APIs are outdated or deprecated APIs. Old versions of APIs often hang around unattended with large scale API development. These APIs can contain vulnerable code and also can happen to expose excessive data as they are no longer being monitored. Production mitigations might also not apply. When talking about zombie APIs, there is another type which would have the same impact if exploited, shadow APIs. Shadow APIs are unknown or undocumented APIs. Tracking such APIs is a challenge, but if the attacker discovers such API endpoints, they can easily use them to exploit unseen vulnerabilities. Number two, unlimited access. Unlimited access has often been the cause for DOS and DDoS attacks, that is, denial of service attacks. Applications and hardware do have a limit that they can handle if API requests were sent so that this limit is exceeded. The resources will exhaust and it results in systems going down. APIs that have no limits in place paves way for this to happen very easily. Next, unlimited access helps in making application feature abuse possible. An example is the abuse of the parcel reset beta API of Meta or what we call Facebook. Facebook had implemented an anti brute force mechanism on this reset API that blocked the user after 10 failed attempts. However, during their research, the security team found that the same API endpoint existed on different API hosts. These API hosts didn't implement the anti brute force mechanism, allowing the attacker to easily trade through the secret token and reset the victim's password. Large scale exploitation. There are cases where large volumes of data are allowed to be scraped out of entire databases. This will not be possible in one go if certain rate limits or usage restrictions are imposed. Then runtime API traffic can be detected for abnormal behavior so that required measures can be taken soon. Number three, not getting API authentication and authorization right. Well, what is authentication? It is the process of proving you are who you say you are. Then what is authorization? It is the act of granting an authenticated party the permission to do something. So if you look at the API security breaches that are happening out there, many of them are due to the fact 
that we are not getting API authentication and authorization right. Both of the API security breaches that we discussed previously involved the lack of proper authentication and authorization. When talking about API security, the OWASP API security top 10 becomes the most referenced list of security threats faced by APIs. This is the list against which developers implement their API security. Close to 50% of all threats listed here are related to improper authentication and authorization. Broken object level authorization and broken user authentication are the top two. We will, we will be discussing about these threats later in this webinar. Number four, decoupling client security from REST API security. Bumble is a dating app which included premium features as most apps would do. Their limits were largely imposed on the client application. For example, a user had a maximum limit of approximately 100 right swaps or votes per day under the free model. But the only check on this swipe limit is through the mobile front end, which means there is no check on the actual API request. You could simply intercept the API request sent out by the client and send them again to the server to do whatever you want. No limits would apply. You could even gain access to locked features through the API, even if the client application says you are locked. This shows that the client is irrelevant for security if you do not pay close attention to the security of the APIs underlining them. Number five, disregarding API security on a trust framework. Sometimes what happens is when you develop certain APIs internally for use only within your department, you do not pay much attention to adding security controls in terms of authentication and authorization because you trust those people who will be using your API. Then assume that another department of the same organization got to know about your API and they wanted to use it in one of their applications for internal use. They would reach out to you and ask for access to the API. You will happily provide them access again through trust. Later, this API grows so much in popularity that you now have to give public access to this API. What about authentication and authorization then? It will be very difficult to impose proper controls now, maybe because you are too late. That's why we need to think about API security from the start. Now, let's talk very briefly about the top 10 API security threats or vulnerabilities listed by OWASP, in short, for Open Web Application Security Project. We cannot ignore this list when talking about API security. If you want to secure your APIs properly, it is important to know what could go wrong. Number one, broken object level authorization. This is where a user is allowed to access a resource that he or she should not have access to. John is a user of an application which calls a personal info API to retrieve his personal information, such as the address, credit card information, and the phone number. When John realizes that this application sends out an ID in the API request, which is his ID, he decides to replace this with another and send the API request to the backend. This returned the personal information of Mary, who was another user of the application. She had nothing to do with John, but her personal information is exposed. This is broken object level authorization where the attacker substitutes the ID of their own resource in the API call with an ID of a resource belonging to another user, which he should not have access to. This issue is extremely common in API-based applications because the server component usually does not fully track the client state and instead relies more on parameters like object IDs that are sent from the client to decide which objects to access. Number two, broken user authentication. This is where the attack is allowed to assume another user's identity. Usage of weak authentication mechanisms such as basic auth makes these attacks possible. If an attacker is able to steal the user credentials, they can gain access to another user's resources and personal information, pretending to be the original user. Stronger authentication mechanisms are required to mitigate such attacks. Number three, excessive data exposure. This is where the API exposes a lot more data than what 
the client legitimately needs, relying on the client to do the fit. These API responses might include sensitive data that should not be returned to the user, which can ultimately be used by the attacker sniffing the traffic to exploit other more serious vulnerabilities. Number four, lack of resources and rate limiting. This is where the API is not protected against an excessive amount of calls or payload sizes. Attackers can use this for denial of service or DOS attacks and authentication flows like brute force attacks. These attacks can lead to major system downtimes if not properly handled through techniques such as rate limiting. Number five, broken function level authorization. Authorization flows can be caused by complex access control policies with different hierarchies, groups, and roles, and also especially by an unclear separation between administrative and regular functions. This is where attackers exploit this vulnerability by sending calls to API endpoints to which they should not have legitimate access. Administrative functions are key targets for this type of attack. John is an employee of the IT department and he has legitimate access to employee info endpoint of this employee for API. But the accounts endpoint should legitimately be accessed by employees of the finance department. Even though John is from the IT department, he was able to access the accounts API endpoint successfully to retrieve information about the employee named Roger. This is not legitimate use of the accounts endpoint. Hence, there is a broken function level authorization. Number six, mass assignment. This is where users are allowed to modify object properties that are not supposed to be updated by them. Exploitation of mass assignment is easier in APIs since by design they expose the underlying implementation of the application along with the name of the properties. The Info API allows the user to update their name and the phone number. Therefore, John sent a put request to the Info endpoint with a payload containing only the object properties name and phone number. But he noticed that in the returned response, there is an additional field for credit. This credit amount is a read-only value, which is not supposed to be updated by the user. But then John tried sending the update request with the additional field credit in the payload by changing its value. As expected, the credit value in the return response changed to the value supplied by John. This API is vulnerable to mass assignment. Such exploitations may lead to privilege escalation, data tampering, bypass of security mechanisms, and more. Number seven, security misconfiguration. Security misconfigurations can expose sensitive user data as well as system details that may lead to full server compromise. Shortcomings in the API implementation and how the API server itself is configured can expose security vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Exposed files, unsecured transport such as HTTP, poor cross policy enforcement, unnecessary feature enablement, and verbose error messages are few of such vulnerabilities. Number eight, injection. This is where the attackers are able to send malicious input to the system and make them execute. The attacker's malicious data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or accessing data without proper authorization. Injection can lead to information disclosure and data loss. It can also lead to DOS or complete host takeover. Number nine, improper assets management. This is where attackers are allowed to launch attacks by using security flows of older, unpatched versions of APIs that are connected to the same database. These old APIs might not have security mechanisms that are put in place to protect the more recent API versions. Number 10, insufficient logging and monitoring. Due to insufficient logging and monitoring of API requests, API attacks can go unnoticed. Most breach studies demonstrate the time to detect a breach is over 200 days, and they are typically detected by external parties rather than internal processes for monitoring. Lack of visibility into ongoing malicious activities gives attackers plenty of time to fully compromise systems. Now, as we know why we should think about API security seriously and what are the most common pitfalls of API security, it is time to identify ways and means to mitigate them 
and make sure our APIs are secure. I will now hand over the control to my colleague Sampat to talk about the essentials of API security that will help us survive the API security apocalypse. Thanks, Tarika. Hello, everyone. I am Sampat Rajapaksha. So I'll be continuing the rest of the presentation, starting with the essentials of API security. First, let's talk about what is API discovery and cataloging in terms of API security. Let me ask you a question. Do you know your APIs? As we discussed during the previous session, under the most common pitfalls of API security, zombie APIs and shadow APIs poses a higher threat for API attacks or breaches. Unknown to you, there can be insecure API endpoints hanging around and that gives easy access to your most valuable data. So how can you make sure that you are safe from that threat of zombie APIs and shadow APIs in your enterprise? This is where API discovery and cataloging come into play. API discovery is simply about discovering your APIs. This is not final destination or means to an end, but a continuous process that never ends. It is essential that you manage and maintain a catalog of your own APIs. This will include the task of reaching out to people in your organization to ask for information about the APIs and then aggregating all documents and information about these APIs are located and finally taking all of them to a centralized location to begin standardizing how the APIs will be defined and documented. So once the necessary information is gathered, we can begin standardizing the representation presentations of APIs. And not only the open API definitions, which consist of all technical details of API, but also information such as licensing, pricing, and terms and services can also be included in your API catalog. This process should also include data classification to highlight what type of sensitive or private data that are exposed. Having an up-to-date and accurate API inventory is critical and essential for many aspects of IT in an organization. Compliance, risk, and privacy teams require API inventory because they must answer to regulated bodies. Having a central place to look up all information about APIs exposed by organization help them quickly and accurately deliver the required information when needed. And not only that, uh, most importantly, uh, security teams in organizations also need an API inventory so that they can have a realistic view of their attack surface to help prioritize the wide range of security activities that should be accounted for. So why do we say that API discovery and cataloging should be a continuous activity? Due to the ongoing rapid development of factors, activities of APIs, it becomes very difficult to keep up with the changes. That means a point in time snap of, snapshot of your uh, APIs will be instantly stale the moment you start implementing any control. Also due to increased API integrations and developer practices where delivery is key, your API catalog needs to be continuously and rapidly evolved. Even though this is the case, it has uh, become a must to adapt continuous API discovery and uh, cataloging as an API security essential. Use this process to identify API endpoints and parameters and classify sensitive data which are being exposed. Knowing your APIs in and out helps quickly and easily mitigate any security threat to your APIs. Let's see some of the bits practices that we can incorporate here. Discover APIs in lower environments and not just in production. Lower environment often have less strict security and hence prone to attack. Include API dependencies and third-party APIs in your API catalog. Third-party APIs, or what we call service APIs, are used to provide the external services as part of your API. Do not forget that they are also part of the attack surface. Then uh, tag and label your APIs and microservices as DevOps best practices. This makes it easier to manage many other API lifecycle activities. 
Now let's move on to another essential to API security. This time we are talking about using API gateways for mediation control of your APIs. API mediation provides for improved visibility, accelerated delivery, and increased operational flexibility and improved enforcement capability. An organization can commonly achieve mediation by deploying API gateways and micro gateways that function as reverse proxies or forward proxies or both. By using API gateways, you can achieve improved observability and monitoring capabilities for your inner and outer APIs. Also can easily enforce access control, rate limiting, and message filtering, and can iterate with API security tools for request validations as well. Another key factor when it comes to being an essential for API security is strong authentication and authorization. First, let's talk regarding what is what this means in terms of API authentication. Authentication is about identifying the entity or in other term user requesting access to the API. And based on that identity, deciding whether or not to grant access. Identification is typically performed by either validating something the user knows, like a password or something. User has like a card or fingerprint and in some time, uh, advanced cases, uh, a combination of these is used, such as uh, verifying a password and verifying the correctness of a one-time password sent to the user via XMS. So there are several authentication mechanisms and we will be talking about several key authentication mechanisms which you can utilize to secure your APIs. Now let's see what is meant by the basic authentication. This is the simplest authentication method used in HTTP authentication process. User credentials, a username and password are encoded using a base system algorithm and it is attached to an HTTP header when sending a request. There is a dedicated HTTP header to send this encoded credential. This will be picked up by the authorization um, mechanism before serving the request. In effect, the secret password is sent in the clear for anyone to read and capture. Base64 encoding obscures the username and password, make it less likely that friendly parties will glean password by accidental network observation. However, a given a base64 encoded username and password, the decoding can be performed trivially by reversing the encoding process. Decoding can even be done in seconds by hand with pencil and paper. Base64 encoded password are effectively sent in the clear. Assume that motivated third party will intercept username and password sent by basic authentication. If this is a concern, send all your HTTP transactions over SSL encrypted channels or you or use more uh, secure authentication protocols such as uh, digest authentication. Uh, next authentication mechanism, OAuth 2.0. When it comes to OAuth 2.0 based authentication, there are several key components. Those are resource owner, client, authorization server, and the resource server. Depending on the relationship between each of these parties, the way to acquire an access token, which represents a user's permission for client to access data, might differ. This is where grant types come into picture. More, moreover, these uh, grant types make the O2.0 specification a flexible authorization framework and has made it the de facto authorization mechanism for APIs. Uh, next, uh, we'll be talking about OIDC based authentication. OIDC is referred to as Open ID Connect. And uh, this is also built on top of previously mentioned or 2.0 protocol. In this authentication me mechanism, it is possible to verify the identity of the end user based on authentication performed by an authorization server. While obtaining some uh, profile details about the user using the REST like mechanism. The standard for IDC is governed by the OpenID Foundation. API key authentication. 
This authentication mechanism is a form of application-based security, and this is a simple form of application-based security where it can easily be configured for an API. The API key is simply a string value passed by a client app to the gateway side, and this is uh, used to uniquely identify the client app, and if the app is valid, the flow continues. Note that the API key-based authentication is more suitable for internal APIs within the organization. Next, uh, mutual accessible authentication. And this is a certificate-based authentication where two parties authenticate each other by verifying the provided digital certificate so that both parties are assured of the other's identity. In other words, uh, a client authenticates themselves to a server and that server also authenticates themselves to the client. This process is implemented using a digital certificate issued by the trusted certificate authorities, in other terms, CES. The certificates are managed using a set of public keys and a private key so that both parties can rely on each other for a secure connection. In most cases, mutual SSL authentication is suitable for APIs used by partners or by a known group of clients. Now let's move on to the authorization of an API in terms of it being an essential to API security. The purpose of authorization is to determine access level or user privileges related to system resources. These resources uh, can be uh, APIs, files, data, and even feature of the system. So we will be talking about uh, several common authorization mechanisms that you can utilize. So first uh, we will uh, talk about uh, role-based access control. There may be cases where it is necessary to implement more fine-grained access control. Scopes become a useful so solution for this situation. A scope enables fine-grained access control for each resource of the API based on a specific consumer role, role-based access control. Scopes ensure that uh, only Allowed resources can be accessed by the uh, consumer if the resource is not allowed for consumption uh, based on the role of the consumer, then uh, consuming that resource will not be allowed even though there is a valid access token. Next, uh, SACML-based access control. SACML is an XML-based declarative access control policy language. It can provide a standardized way of validating authorization requests. This can be used to have fine rails, uh, role-based uh, access control for APS. And uh, access control policy language, uh, request response language, and reference architecture is defined in, in a SACML. In the policy language, it defines access control policies, uh, example, who is allowed to do what operations at what time and uh, queries about uh, whether a particular access should be allowed uh, in the request side and answers to those queries uh, in re response side are uh, defined in the request uh, response language. Finally, the reference architecture proposes standard for the deployment of necessary software modules within an infrastructure to allow efficient enforcement of policies. Next, uh, we'll be talking about Open Policy Agent, OPA. OPA is an open source general policy engine. It can unify policy and form enforcement for APIs. With OPA, it is possible to specify policy as a code and simple APIs to offload policy decision making from software. Uh, this can be used not only in API gateways, but also in uh, CICD pipelines, microservices, and Kubernetes setups as well. In OPA, the policy decisions are generated by evaluating the query input against policies and data. These policy decisions will help to determine which users can access, access uh, which resources, which time of the day of the system can be accessed. Let's move on to another essential factor of API security, which is the runtime protection capabilities which you can integrate to the APS. It is important to have advanced security mechanisms to protect APIs from being accessed by bots and hackers. Hackers may try to consume APIs via open ports in the API management system. 
Usually this attempt will be made with an open port scan and should be detected at this stage. These types of attacks should be prevented and information should be sent to the relevant parties to make necessary changes to the system. Until these actions are implemented, the system should automatically block the originating IP address from accessing any more APIs until further notice. This step will further enhance the security of the system and other APIs. Security testing for APIs in particular help identifying vulnerabilities early. This helps to make sure that your APIs will have much less a list of uh, witnessing any potential security attack. If you still don't have such a mechanism to protect the APIs that you develop, this is high time to do so. Penetration testing is one of the most widely used ways to perform security testing for APIs. Now with the advancement of technology, API security testing has become a part of the CICD pipeline. This makes sure that API vulnerabilities are identified before they make into production. Uh, we can identify three main types of API security testing for ease of understanding. Number one, API static API security testing. Static API uh, security testing analyzes the code while at rest to identify vulnerabilities. It detects for vulnerable code and helps developers to improve code quality and security of APIs, ensuring things like whether you are with the uh, proper authentication and authorizations are implemented correctly in your code. Static uh, API security testing tools look out for patterns that might pose security concerns. You can select such tools depending on programming language used when implementing your APIs and applications. Number two, dynamic API security testing. Dynamic API security testing analyzes the API behavior during runtime. That is, uh, they simulate a real-world attack to find security vulnerabilities in the code. This type of security testing is more preferred by developers more than static tools. It helps in identifying security issues in the dependencies or third-party libraries used in the implementation as well. Number three, uh, software composition analysis. Software composition analysis tools Look at the dependency tree of your application and matches this against a database of known vulnerabilities. Using these tools, you will be notified if your implementation uses a library or framework with a known vulnerability. With the increasing use of open source API development, these tools are important to include in your security testing effort. Usually a strong combination of static API security testing, dynamic API security testing, and Software composition analysis yield better results. But if you are not in a position to incorporate all three of them, dynamic API security testing is the way to go. At the beginning of this webinar, we told you that APIs are a treasure trove of valuable data. Hence, it has become a number one concern for data security. Data and network security play a major role in ensuring your APIs are less valuable to unanticipated security breaches. Data security is the process of safeguarding digital information throughout its entire life cycle to protect it from corruption, theft, or unauthorized access. Some techniques that are commonly used for data security include masking, redaction, tokenization, and encryption. But these measures should be taken selectively based on the requirement. These techniques focus on securing the data at rest, such as in a database. But you will understand that these encryption approaches don't necessarily protect your data in case where attackers steal the credentials or obtain an unauthorized session because the data will anyway be detected for them as they are already authenticated and authorized. But these measures may provide you with an extra level of security. Let's look at some of the best practices to follow when talking about data security. Number one, use encryption selectively 
and as mandated by regulation due to operational complexity with this approach. Transport protection suffices for most API use cases. Number two, avoid sending too much data to API callers and rely on API client or front end to filter the data sent from the back end. Sensitive data is always visible in traffic. Consider this scenario. Sometimes it is necessary to retrieve some user claims for authentication purposes. However, that information must be hidden from others, such as the backend service. Data masking becomes a useful solution to address these kind of scenarios. When implementing this strategy, there should be a mechanism to filter sensitive information in the API management system if you have one. This can be achieved by using a message transformation or message mediation logic. Once that is engaged, sensitive information will be filtered or masked with some other data to hide the exact value. Consumers are ensured that their sensitive information is used only for authentication purposes and nothing else. Similar to masking, data redaction can be performed in a conditional manner as well. For example, consider requests uh, sent to check if a person is eligible to vote. Example, people who are 18 years old, over 18 years old, can vote. In this case, API can return the output as a Boolean where it indicates the condition, is this person above 18 years of age, rather than exposing the actual age of the person. This kind of modification can be used to protect sensitive information and mask the data. Number three. Adjust for modern threats like scraping and data interference where encryption is not an effective mitigation. Network security protects your network and data from breaches, intrusions, and other threats. With an increased number of organizations moving toward highly distributed APIs and cloud services, some traditional network access control approaches have become ineffective. Let's now look at the best practices we can incorporate in terms of network security. Number one, enable encrypted transport to protect the data your APIs transmit over unprotected networks. Here, transport uh, encryption with TLS provide confidentiality and integrity of messages in transit. Number two, use IP addresses allow and deny list if you have small number of API consumers such as with partner or supplier integration use cases. This would restrict which origin IP addresses can communicate to a given API. Number three, uh, look to dynamic rate limiting to restrict how uh, frequently requests can be made for an API deployment where API consumers are too numerous or too unpredictable. So with this, we have covered several key API security essentials in this section to mitigate and enhance the APIs and make sure our APIs are secure. Moving on to the final section in which we are discussing ways of using API security at DevOps level and how to integrate them in CICD pipeline. The core stages of CICD pipeline typically don't make sense to security. You can write, test, deploy, and monitor applications without securing them at each stage in CICD pipeline. But failing to bake security into CICD leaves you at risk either of falling to secure your applications at all or of trying to manage security as a separate process that is not integrated into the application delivery workflow. In the latter case, it becomes difficult to ensure that security problems are detected and resolved quickly and efficiently. The wide adoption of cloud native applications and infrastructure has propelled DevOps and self service culture, enabling developers to go from core to cloud in hours. Meanwhile, legacy app security systems and processes have impeded security teams from being able to scale at the speed of DevOps with very little less uh, visibility or control over any security risk. Security teams are entirely unprepared to govern and uh, secure the modern SDLC in this agile world. Here are the drawbacks for using traditional approach. Number one, in traditional approach, 
teams need to rely on heavy manual analysis to check for vulnerabilities. Number two, since it's manual analysis, more often than not, frequency become very low and most probably analysis will only happen at one time before production release. Also, if it's an urgent release, then most uh, manual vulnerability checks will be skipped. Number three, security analysis of APIs are considered a road, roadblock to quick development since it's traditionally relying on manual analysis. Number four, uh, need proper security professionals guidance each time of analysis since it's manual. Now let's see how these uh, drawbacks of traditional approach have mitigated by uh, Dev Security Ops uh, approach. Number one, uh, introducing security testing using uh, a tool for each build using a proper security vulnerability analyzing tool. Uh, number two, integrating security as guardrail in which proper policies are defined in terms of security. Number three, unlike uh, considering API security as a blocker to quicker development, developers need to have unified approach where security is considered not only at the end of the release, but also throughout the development process. Number four, using API security tools and such uh, throughout development process make it more developer friendly and does not require to rely on heavily on uh, security professional at each phase of the CICD pipeline. In its simple form, security guardrails are controls that uh, prevent deviation from expected behavior. Organizations who adopt security guardrails see the following benefit. Number one, developers can operate at speed without requiring active involvement from the security team. Number two, Automating security controls in developer workforce lead to consistent security checks and doesn't have to rely on manual analysis. Number three, the development teams are less likely to ignore and bypass security when the controls and proper policies are baked into the development process. So you are much more less likely to, to get bugs in your system. Now let's talk about why API security at guardrails is essential part in the CICD pipeline in depth. Large enterprise organizations have recognized the necessity of enabling engineering teams to build secure software while providing them with an appropriate security context to make decisions. Below are some reasons why modern organizations need to depend on security guardrails to provide consistent, actionable, safe service security guidance to developers in software development life cycle. Reason one, digital transformation and uh, cloud native adoption has transformed how developers produce and deploy software. Instead of monolithic software built on waterfall model, microservices have led the software development and deployment at an exponential rate. This modern uh, software development life cycle means developers cannot rely on traditional app sec method, waiting for security teams to perform security reviews on per application basis. The modern SDLC goes from core to cloud before security teams are even aware. So manual security controls are entirely ineffective and it is exponentially more difficult and expensive to have developers go back and fix security tech debt. The only solution to this is to build security policies and controls as guardrails in CICD system to proactively ensure that vulnerabilities are not introduced during development. Reason two. The developer-owned modern software development lifecycle has led to a world where developers have autonomy in selecting their tech stack, open source, and in commercial ways, and can go from core to cloud in a matter of hours. This developer empowerment has enormous benefit for the business as it drives tremendous innovation at an unprecedented pace. However, it also means that external teams like security and compliance have lost the visibility and governance over what is built and deployed. 
Security controls would not have a place, uh, place in a modern development model if they require developers to stop their work and wait for security. The only way to ensure security and compliance of the software being built is to create security controls that are enforceable guardrails within the modern development life cycle. Number three, software supply chains are now highly complex and interdependent global ecosystem. The risk of not building assurances in the complex software pipeline are painfully evident from ever increasing list of events like Log4j, Spring for Shell, and SolarWind vulnerabilities. These issues go beyond traditional app security and merely scanning for vulnerabilities uh, doesn't make sense. They require a broader set of uh, security controls and policies, guardrails to enforce secure default and safe practices throughout the development and deployment lifecycle. Finally, let's see how future would look like DevOps space with the adoption of API security at, as guardrails. Number one, security guardrails empowers organization to associate context-specific security policies and controls that can be defined by security teams and applied within developer workflows. The security function must adapt to the speed at which developers are deploying. Number two, security guardrails are the only way to ensure that developers adopt security process into their rightful place within their development life cycle. This adoption eliminates the friction between developers and security and ensures developers can go from core to cloud securely. Number three, the DevOps culture has enabled development teams to produce applications at breakneck speed, and legacy app security gatekeeping has no chance of keeping up with the pace of this development. Security guardrails solves this problem by building security into modern software development life cycle, inherently ensuring that the quickest path to deployment is also the most secure. The entire software development lifecycle benefits and frictions between teams is virtually eliminated by allowing a developer's team to develop and deploy software continuously with little active input from app security teams. So we have come to the end of this webinar. Today we have discussed why we should think about API security seriously. Then we discuss the most common pitfalls of API security, especially about zombie APIs and shadow APIs, unlimited access, not getting authentication on authorization right, decoupling client security from REST API security, and disregarding API security on a trust framework. This would have given you an understanding about most common security loopholes we miss or even we just ignore. We also went through a comprehensive outlook on OWAP's API security top 10 list. Then we dived deep into essentials of API security. Those essentials were API discovery, cataloging, and mediation control with API gateways, strong authentication and authorization, runtime protection, API security testing and data and network security, then we ended the session by discussing about API security at DevOps and CICD pipelines. We hope you would have gained a clear and comprehensive understanding about API security and how to survive the API security apocalypse by attending this webinar. You can adopt these things that you learned today and make sure that APIs and systems are actually secure from ever increasing security breaches. Now it's time for the questions.